Okay, my name is Stacy Krim and I'm here today with David Gwynn. Today is June 20th, 2019, and we are speaking with um, Johnny McGee and Bruce Tatey. Thank you for speaking with us today. Oh, you're welcome. So, um, how long have you lived in the Triad area? I moved to the Triad the summer of 85. I had finished all my PhD work for the, master, the PhD in Spanish, mm -hmm. and... <clears throat> A faculty member, a good friend, encouraged me to get out of Chapel Hill. So I interviewed for a position at UNCG as a visiting lecturer in Spanish, and I moved here. Okay. And so I've been in, this has been home since 1985. All right, then how about you? I moved out here in November of 1985, and it was a job opportunity. Okay. Yeah, so... Excellent. So what uh, what was the climate like when you moved here for, for LGBT people? For LGBT. There, it, there was a lot that was opening up mm -hmm. in, in the triad, but there were still, you know, some reservations. And when we moved, our, my big concern when I got here was the AIDS epidemic. You know, I wanted to know, are there people in the triad who have AIDS and need some kind of help or assistance. Mm -hmm. And so that motivated me. There was a, a bar in downtown Greensboro, right near, it used to be right near the baseball stadium, called Busby's. It was not your standard gay bar where the disco lights and people dancing until two, three, four in the morning. Busby's had a pool, a pool table a couple of TVs, a bar, some tables and chairs. And I found out there were people going there on Wednesday nights to watch Dynasty. So I was a Dynasty, Dynasty fan, <laughs> I, and I started going to Busby's on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I met Sherry, who was the partner of a lady that was in, working at UNCG. <laughs> Um, and got to know Sherry, and Sherry's actually the ones that introduced us. Oh, wow. Um, so did you frequent Busby's as well? Actually, well, I went there, I had started work here and was looking for some sort of connection someplace, and I heard about the bar, and so I went there. After talking to Sherry, um, she was from Iowa City, and I had gone to school in Iowa City. And we have a mutual friend who lives actually in California now. And he had called her up and said, he's moving to Greensboro, I'll take care of him. Oh. So she showed up at my, my apartment. I was living in Jamestown at that time and, and said, look, why don't you get to come down to Busby's? It's, this is where it is. And, you know, this night is a fun night to go. And so that's kind of was how I got connected into that. Mm -hmm. Just really. And then later on, we found out there were some actually some social groups Mm -hmm. We met to together for something really exciting like potlucks <laughs> and that sort of thing that we kind of got hooked into. Right. When did you first come become aware of the AIDS epidemic? Was that before you moved to Greensboro? It be was before I moved here. Um, they were watching nightly news mm -hmm. probably around 81, 82. They were started talking about uh, this strange infection that seemed to be just in the gay community. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I know for a long time they didn't have a name for it. Uh, but I would watch the NBC, CBS News in the evenings, and I would see clips interviewing doctors, interviewing patients, and I thought, this is my community. I want to do something that will help. Mm -hmm. And have you been involved in any uh, support groups before you moved to Greensboro for AIDS patients? No, uh-uh. Okay. Um, so you were one of, the, you were founded at the Triad Health Project? Yeah, we're two of the co-founders okay. of Triad Health Project. Busby was actually the one, there was a group of about 12 yeah. people that were going to Busby's and talking with him, are there cases in Greensboro? Mm -hmm. You know, are there people that need assistance? And he's the one that brought everybody together. Uh, our first time we met was a Sunday afternoon at one of the homes. 
And that was where we all shared our concerns mm -hmm. about AIDS and in the triad. And we started trying to contact different individuals about what can we do to, one, get a court incorporated, get the uh, tax st status to as a violent uh, non-profit. Mm -hmm. And we worked closely with the group out of uh, Chapel Hill, Durham. Mm -hmm. They already had a group performed. It was the gay men... What was the name of it? I don't remember the name of it. Was it the uh, the gay men's chorus? It wasn't the gay men's chorus, but it was a a group that was in Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, in the Triangle, that already had established themselves as a nonprofit. Okay. So we worked under their umbrella the first couple of years while we were doing all the paperwork and getting all of the nonprofit status. And they actually let us, if we did a fundraiser, people could write checks to them, but they would give the money to us. It was mainly working with them, trying to put together training programs. Right. And that for dealing, you know, trying to be as helpers, buddies, if you will, to people with HIV. And, and uh, they had an established program and tied into some of the national organizations. And so we use them as a basis to try and develop our own training programs locally okay. and that working with Moses Cohen at that time mm -hmm. uh, right. was very supportive and was happy to have somebody trying to put together some sort of right. organization. And what was your sense of the, um, the AIDS epidemic in this area? Oh, it, it was definitely here. Mm -hmm. um, we met Tim Lane, who was the head of um, Infectious Disease. Uh huh. Infectious Disease. Uh, he introduced us to um, the nurse. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Teresa Suet. Not Teresa. Uh, uh, it'll come to me. <laughs> um, one of his nurses in the clinic. She introduced us to Hope Vaughn, who was a, a social worker at the hospital. And pretty soon after we formed, I mean, as soon as we formed, we were getting referrals from Tim and the other doctors in the infectious disease clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was predominantly gay males that, that were our initial clients. And so we would help them with housing issues, with applying for uh, food stamps, mm -hmm. for uh, Medic Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, often I would go with them to social services and sit there for support mm -hmm. uh, as they were being interviewed. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we ran into all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I was there with one young man uh, and the the caseworker handed him a form to sign and a pen. And as he was handing the pen back to her, she said, do you mind if I ask you what's wrong with you? And he looked at her and he said, I have AIDS. She threw the pen across the room. I walked over, picked up the pen. I rubbed it on my skin, rubbed it on my face. And I told her, ma'am, I want to see your supervisor. I want to talk with your supervisor about getting people to come in and give y'all training about how it's transmitted and how it's not. Mm -hmm. Because you can't get this if you touch something that somebody else who has AIDS. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I met with the supervisor and I said, here's Tim Lane's name, contact him and get one of his doctors to come and talk with y'all about AIDS 101. Mm -hmm. I said, we need to get ed educate the people and they'll know how to react. Right. So did you do education for all of the health networks in this area? Well, we were, we were working that time trying to build what was called the Buddy Program at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was people who were actually going to volunteer to be linked to a particular patient or somebody who was positive and then kind of act as their support person, a little bit like, like the, what the hospice program mm -hmm. does and that. So we had gotten the, the training program put together 
had a lot of support in setting up, uh, put out a call for volunteers, and then had a lot of support, particularly from Moses Cohn, because mm-hmm. they were so relieved to find somebody that would help them address it, because they were seeing more and more cases and really didn't know mm-hmm. what to do once a person left the hospital and, and, that, and to kind of do a sort of case management sort of program. So um, we started that outreach primarily get the buddy program rolling and then also what offer are you know coming in and talking to different groups about you know this is what it is these are the issues um, you know this is what you need to worry about what you don't need to worry about um, they actually got quite a variety of different mm-hmm. groups saying you know could you send somebody just to talk and explain you know what's going on and you got Usually sort of a mixed response. Um, you had some people that were very willing to listen and some had just kind of thought, you know, this is what they deserve, you know, mm-hmm. the attitude that was put on at that time. Even within the hospital, you had to be kind of careful because usually there was big infection control signs outside of the particular patient's room and, and some of the medical staff were pretty supportive, some were not. The nice thing was that the administration at the hospital, particularly, like I said, in most common at that time, um, if we said, you know, look, we're having trouble with nurse so-and-so, and that um, it was corrected immediately. Mm-hmm. And then they really went out of their way to make sure that people got support and, and uh, were treated with respect. Wow. Do you happen to know kind of the population, the number of HIV and AIDS patients um, when the epidemic began through your process of working with the... Um, uh, we With went from a few up to several hundred several almost hundred. immediately, and that was pretty much Greensboro, some high points, point. and then some of the surrounding small Burlington to a certain extent, although they tend to lean more toward the triangle sometimes, um, and then the smaller towns, and that we went into some pretty small towns, mm-hmm. and that and we try to meet clients and that get things set up, um, but yeah, it was it, it expanded exponentially. Uh, mm-hmm. Once people started, and it wasn't that it was this disease was spreading that fast. People were just becoming aware. Mm-hmm. You know, they got sick, and at that point in time, there wasn't much medication mm-hmm. that could give it to them. So you basically, what happened is they come in with some acute problem, uh, pretty sick, and be diagnosed, and so, and got referred to us pretty quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. But people, general just testing was not very popular at that, or didn't happen very mm-hmm. often. Because it was kind of a, a process, you had to go to the health services, or and that it was limited access to actually getting tested at that time, mm-hmm. which of course has changed dramatically mm-hmm. now. But um, at that time, it, it's not people really didn't find out until they were very sick. Yeah. Did you uh, help the patients interact with their families after yeah. the diagnosis? Can you speak a bit about that? <coughs> Um, we got, uh, I mean, it, was a, it really, well, yeah, there was, there was a wide variety. I mean, you had the family members who wanted to be supportive, but were clueless what to do, um, you know, scared, you know, because at the time, they, you know, which everything yeah. you saw in the popular press was pretty negative and, you know, um, and basically getting them educated. And you saw the cases where they just got tossed out. I mean, it's like, leave the house, do not come back. And, um. Yeah, and trying to find housing in some cases sure. uh, for some people that were on the verge of being homeless, um, trying to work with landlords, trying to find some place where we could get them established, and that there was a lot of that. It was it really ran a full gamut, mm-hmm. and that you had some parents that were extremely, or family members, not always parents, or maybe usually it was a sister or brother that was extremely supportive and very helpful, um, and then you had the ones that just absolutely wrote everything off and were hostile. Um, so, it, it, <laughs> yeah, got a lot of interaction with, with family members. Did you see improvement from yeah, the yeah. early 80s onward? Mm-hmm. Can you speak a bit about that improvement in the process? I think that as people became more knowledgeable mm-hmm. about HIV AIDS, how it's transmitted, how it isn't, uh, families, friends became more understanding. It's just in that, I call it the dark era. Mm-hmm. 
of AIDS, where the researchers were trying to develop drugs to help. They were trying to develop tests and things like that. And it wasn't un it really wasn't unusual for a client to be referred and in three, six months, they're gone. And a lot of them were reacting to AZT. That was the big drug in the 80s. You had to take it every four hours, even at night. And a lot of people died because of what AZT did to their bodies. Mm -hmm. It was just that strong a drug, but it was helping to keep people alive. Mm -hmm. And over the years, as they developed the, the different cocktails, they, they called them, uh, combinations of medicines, people are, were diagnosed in the 90s as having AIDS, and they're still with us right. today. And we saw a lot of change, I would say, on a lot of different levels. It wasn't just the families that were changing. It was also uh, professionals. Um, initially, like I said, Moses Cohen was a godsend because they, were, they knew that the issue was coming. Tim Lane was responsible for a lot of that. And they jumped in pretty early to be supportive. Some of the other smaller regional hospitals were not quite so, so friendly, mm -hmm. um, which meant spent a lot of time meeting with board members of the hospital, their um, head of their staff, the nursing and, and, and medical boards, and that, and kind of just walking through things and getting explanations of what needed to be done. And, that. and actually, in most cases, it wasn't always so friendly at the beginning, but they, they were professionals in the sense that they did make a real effort to, to reach out and, and kind of deal with the issue. Um, especially we had such a good example with Cone and there's a little bit of jealousy sometimes. You say, well, this hospital does a really great job and, so, <laughs> and you're not. Um, then all of a sudden it becomes a matter of pride. Well, you know, we can do too. Um, so that really, really kind of made, and that group fairly quickly, again, as the knowledge became more common as far as understanding what, what the disease was like and what transmitted um, issues were and, and, and that, um, but it, it's, it took some time and at the same time we were developing all the background information to try and become a United Way agency mm -hmm. and that took all a fair amount of education too because we had to deal with the, the governing board, um, educating the members of that board as to what was really going on, um, the need for it, the size of the organization that was going to be needed and that because there was some push initially for us to combine with an existing organization like the Red Cross mm -hmm. and that and it took a lot of documentation on the growth because we, I mean exponentially is how the, the patient load was growing and how the organization had to grow um, and trying to get that education about how big you know this really was an issue in the triad area particularly um, in all of North Carolina um, so there was, there was, I, we spent a lot of time talking and trying to educate, I would say, besides all the patient care. Fortunately, at that time, we were starting to get enough funding, we could get staff, and could take on some of the case management portion of it, because for the first couple years, uh, case management files were underneath a bed in our house, where they thought nobody would find them, um, <laughs> and, and that pretty much uh, was where it ran out of, you know, along with other Really, I mean, we've had great luck in Greensboro, I would say, as far as volunteers and that. We've got a lot of support from surprising areas. and that people Some of the churches. Churches in particular. Mm -hmm. um, the Episcopalians were wonderful. Um, some of the other smaller churches particularly dove in, too, and, and really gave us, when we said we need help, we need people, we need time, and that they, they came to really support it as did you um, do any training for the local universities or school systems? I'm going to say yes in the sense when I was teaching at High Point College, uh, I would take a, someone with AIDS to speak openly with the students uh, in the evenings. Mm -hmm you know, to share their story about how they became infected, what their life was like before and after diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And um, I was able to reach out a good bit since I was teaching at High Point mm -hmm. uh, there. 
And about what year was that? That would have been, I was at High Point from 87 to about um, 94. So th this was basic in, in the late 80s, the mm -hmm. early 90s. But Did you have any sense of how UNCG or High Point uh, College handled AIDS on their campuses? I was, uh, the faculty in the Romance languages were very supportive of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, the two years that I was at UNCG. And I know UNCG had a fairly well-formed LGBT group on campus, um, mm -hmm. and they were supportive. I mean, we would take uh, someone, you know, to, to speak on campus uh, at UNCG, mm -hmm. but... Actually, our client load really didn't have a lot of college-age yeah. students at that mm -hmm. time, or if they were that age, they weren't college students they were working in, mm -hmm. in local aid. And say most of them, well, the first wave really was older white males, and that, and then it started the the drug components started to show up, and we started seeing a lot of times, well, a lot of women because they were sexual partners of somebody who was using uh, drugs, um, but it really started to shift and got a much broader population as far as the type of, of client. A lot of women, a lot of minority people. Um, and really, the college group never numbers really were that high mm -hmm. in that it was um, usually slightly older, or if they were younger, they were they are not in college. They were usually out working mm -hmm. environment someplace. And in the local bar scene, you mentioned that all of this came about mm -hmm. from people meeting. What was what protections or uh, how did that change the local social scene? The larger gay bars, which were like the discos, the mm -hmm. um, they would let us go to the bar and hand out condoms mm -hmm. or hand out literature about HIV AIDS. And they did fundraising. We, they did fundraisers to help out mm -hmm. where they would give uh, so much of the door mm -hmm. take to THP. Mm -hmm. um, but they were very receptive. They were con the, the owners of the bars were very concerned, mm -hmm. you know, because that was their clientele mm -hmm. that was uh, being affected mm -hmm. by HIV/AIDS. Right, and as you were doing education, this of course started with people thinking it was a, a gay disease. Mm -hmm. So you're going in and you're doing education not only for AIDS but also for just LGBT issues. Mm -hmm. It may have been the first training people had ever been through. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, we we would get calls for some have to someone who was gay mm -hmm. or lesbian to go talk about their experience. Mm -hmm. You know, not to share the the details, but when did they first feel that there was something a little bit different mm -hmm. about themselves uh, and how the, they dealt with it coming out to family and friends, how are family and friends responding. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did a, a lot of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it helped that we were both over six foot and had deep yeah. voices. And, right. <laughs> and uh, it was not quite what they expected. Right. <laughs> One of the times that was probably the nurse, most nerve-wracking for me was this was around the time that they had the Klan, the shooting right. in downtown Greensboro. And there was a communist group that wanted co someone to come and do education with them. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the two that went. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know where we were going in Greensboro. When we got there, I was a little unsure if, about my safety. But it turned out they were extremely accepting mm -hmm. uh, and you know, were very appreciative that we had gone and spent it, some time with them to help increase their awareness about HIV AIDS. Wow. And how long did you, did you um, work with the, were you a part of the Triad Health Project? Are you still involved today? We are not as involved as the early days, 
but we still we will be hosting a dining for friends mm -hmm. we've hosted one of those every year to help raise funds for triad health project mm -hmm. yeah during the early years it was pretty much our life <laughs> um, mm -hmm. i mean get calls at work and i had a really good secretary who, who took the messages and that but she knew what it was for and never really got any grief mm -hmm. of that thank god um but um and i was board president for two years three years running um as we were growing but um and then johnny led actually for several support groups particularly for hispanics for spanish speaking mm -hmm. and that and but a lot of that because of the medications a lot of that's dropped yeah. off mm -hmm. the need isn't there because people are living and working full-time uh mm -hmm. now so, so the the type of needs have really changed mm -hmm. and that um we you know try to be supportive and now it's more fundraising mm -hmm. um, than really actually hands-on. Mm -hmm. um, and in your work, did you see a distinct difference in how um, age, AIDS patients uh, in different ethnic groups were accepted or how the stereotypes different were different mm -hmm. among those groups? In the African-American community, there appeared to be resistance and not that people were not willing to talk mm -hmm. about HIV AIDS. Um, we had one client, Curtis, who was a drug dealer all of his life. He had his wife, former wife, still lived in Greensboro with three daughters, a set of twins and then a single birth. And Curtis was diagnosed as having full-blown AIDS, and I got the phone call. Come, a very straight man, African-American, um, there may be some resistance, but just be yourself with it. And so I went to the hospital, knocked on his door, walked in, and there on his little table was the full open spread of Playboy magazine. He wanted it clear to me from the first minute I walked in, I'm straight, I'm not gay. So I sat down and talked with Curtis about THP, what we could help with, and he agreed to become a client. And so one of the first things we had to do was work out housing for him found an apartment above, oh, there was a gay... It was near the college. Yeah, yeah, it was near the college. And they rented an apartment mm -hmm. to him. And as it turned out, we had Curtis for about three years. Yeah, he, he got it. He pulled us into everything. We were going to Narconics Anonymous meetings with him. And that, and got to know all of his friends. So it was got to be interesting. We'd come home, and then our entire driveway, because Curtis was living with us at that time, because he needed more help, support. Uh -huh. And that we had a whole driveway full of motorcycles, and <laughs> the neighbors kind of going, "What's going on here?" And and you two stand. Um, it it <laughs> he got to be that. That was his full his full reason for living was going out helping people, particularly those who were, had been infected through, through drug use and that, and pulling them into support meetings, pulling them into, you know, getting help and that, and really gave us a, a, a avenue into to a group that we had a hard time getting into um, before. And, and since we were showing up at the, the NA meetings and that, they, they trusted us and, that, and they kind of saw how we were treating him. Um, actually drove up to New Jersey and brought his mother down uh, when it was the last few weeks, and he actually ended up dying in our home um, because we had set up a hospital bed in that morning when he really couldn't, was pretty much bedridden in that. But Curtis he, had, al had always told me, you're the only person I'll let clean my butt. <laughs> 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 and he meant it. Mm -hmm. and that, but um, he actually was, was quite a... For having been a former, you know, drug dealer and, and whatever, and he freely admitted that, um, he really turned his life around and really helped a lot of people mm -hmm. in that because we really got an avenue into a crowd that we couldn't couldn't hadn't been able to help before because there was no way to break into that that sort of society. Mm -hmm. 
and and give our neighbours a real thrill too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, when Greensboro had a fair size uh, gay Hispanic population, they tried go into the regular men's support group, but they just did not have the vocabulary right. in English, often not, not necessarily in Spanish, when you start talking about infections and, and illnesses and stuff. So I got a phone call. Would you do a support group in Spanish? Yeah, I'll do that for THP. So we met twice a month. There was about, at its peak, about six people that were attending the support group. But I was seeing a lot of the same things that I saw in the African-American community. The hesitance to talk, not wanting anybody to know what that I got this infection. Uh, just nearly neurotic. Who, when, when's somebody else going to find out? Because mm -hmm. I... My big point with at the beginning of every meeting and at the end, we do not share anything with anybody that is discussed in this room. Mm -hmm. This is your safe spot to come and talk in Spanish, to learn about HIV AIDS, to learn about medications, but we don't share. If, if we pass on the street just a little way, but if I'm with three people and they go, who's that? Oh, that's a friend of mine who's Hispanic. But I, I wouldn't share details, and they weren't supposed to share details with anybody because the Hispanic community, they felt ostracized already just because they were Hispanic. They may be here legally or illegally, illegally but they did not want anybody sharing their information with anybody else mm -hmm. in the community. So it took a good bit of work those first couple of months to reassure them this is your safe spot. We don't talk about this to anybody outside of group. And it was up to them if they wanted to share their phone number mm -hmm. with somebody or share where they lived with somebody. But nobody had a list of names, phone numbers, addresses that they that could fall out of your pocket as you're walking down the street. Did you uh, have any women you worked yeah. with? Yeah. Initially, most of the women that we had either were sharing needles with somebody taking drugs or it maybe was the wife of a husband who the wife had no idea he was fooling around with other men. And so there in, in that situation, the wives needed information. Uh, and hospice did start for a number of years. They had a support group for family and friends, and it was strictly HIV AIDS mm -hmm. affected by that. And so that, I co-facilitated the group, group with Kim, uh, who was a social worker at hospice. She and I would do that twice a month uh, for family and friends. And that was, it was something that was really needed, mm -hmm. you know, in the community. Did you have any trans individuals as clients? I don't remember any trans. Well, we had... A couple that sort of showed up in Greensboro. Later on, I yeah. Think somebody said, "Leave. Here's a bus ticket." And Greensboro was a, in that because it was known that there was an established support group at the Cone at that particular time. They actually had a clinic mm -hmm. um, for HIV that met Thursdays. Thursdays. And well, that's, Cone also formed a AIDS team mm -hmm. at the hospital where there were a couple of nurses. Hope, the social worker, was on the AIDS team. As soon as we were able to hire uh, counselors, full-time staff, all of the staff that were uh, managing clients, mm -hmm. or case managers for uh, T 
PHP clients were members of the AIDS team. A few uh, professionals from outside Triad Health Project, outside the hospital, were on the team. Mm -hmm. And we would meet every Thursday mm -hmm. to talk. Because Cone, when they discharge somebody, they wanted to be sure, are they taking their meds on time? They've got to take this every four hours. And so our volunteers often, when they were going in to meet with their buddy, is the term we used, both the volunteer and the person infected were buddies, was the term we used. And uh, they knew to talk with them about medications. If they were having difficulty, share that with the case manager so the case manager could bring that information to the team mm -hmm. that met uh, every Thursday. Mm -hmm. And we usually did that over lunch. How did you select volunteers to work with the clients? One, one of the big things is that they wanted to do something. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make a difference. And so, I, I don't we, think we, we really, really had never had a problem. We actually had quite a few step up and then, and again, that's where the, some of the churches really came in mm -hmm. strong. Um, they once, um, particularly the Episcopalians in Greensboro, mm -hmm. really dove into it, and it became a thing that church members did. They volunteered and showed up. Uh, some were health professionals who mm -hmm. had to deal with it, and well, were involved at a different level. Like your your hairstylist, she went through that first buddy yeah. training program. So she had, in the hairstylist community, a number of the guys that are styling hair were gay. And so she had a number of friends who were gay, and she wanted to go through that first buddy training. And actually we got a spillover from hospice quite a bit too, because they were getting more clients um, who were in, in uh, later stages of the disease, mm -hmm. and they had volunteers who really kind of wanted the hospice training really didn't deal with that specific component of it very well, or not very well, but I mean, just never had uh, focused on it. And so there would be get a lot of crossover from that. People that were both hospice volunteers and also for the health project would volunteer. Um, if, if our client load was pretty much covered at that point, then they would, they would deal more with hospice patients, but they, there was a lot of crossover mm -hmm. in there because we got, I mean, between Cone and, and Hospice of Greensboro and that, there was a lot of support and a lot mm -hmm. of, I mean, a lot of coordination. Uh, in fact, there was a regional board that was put together that covered Greensboro High Point and some of the smaller towns that would have started to meet monthly, I think, and they would actually work to try and coordinate efforts in that. There was, once the response started, I, I, we were very impressed with how people dove in and really wanted to be involved wanted to address it. When we were first meeting, our vision was of the triad, Winston-Salem, High Point, Greensboro. Unbeknownst to us, there was already a group forming in Winston. I think the AIDS Task Force is what they were called. Um, and so they functioned in Winston-Salem and some of the smaller towns outside of Winston, and we had an office in Greensboro and one in High Point to cover the clients in mm -hmm. High Point. But we ended up going, I mean, we've been to Eden, been yeah. to Reedsville, yeah. and uh, some of the smaller towns too. And a lot of times the patients of that group would actually stay in their hometown because that's where we had some family members that were supportive in that, but they just needed a connection and that, so there was a lot of, not just within Greensboro mm -hmm. High Point, Burlington definitely. But that, again with that, the smaller the town, the greater the fear. I mean, we had in Eden, um, the African American family, their son. Yeah. That they were, they were care providers for him, but they were afraid, don't let anybody else in town know what, why we're taking care of him. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the greater the fear in the smaller communities was due to wanting to just protect the secret, mm -hmm. the big secret. Mm -hmm. 
And in a given small community, would it only be one person, or would you see multiple people in the same com- in that community? Just to give an idea of the demographics uh-huh. for AIDS patients in the small communities. That was the only family I remember yeah. helping out in Eden. It, it was pretty, I mean, because it was a secret. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they, they'd really, if there had been other ones, they didn't know about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They just, you know, were lucky, somehow picked up on the information that there was a group in Greensboro and that, um, I don't even know how, but usually it was usually a very isolated situation mm-hmm. um, because of the, the secrecy component, yeah. you know, either nobody knew that their child was gay or, or, um, or if they, even if they weren't, but they didn't know that they were ill. And of course he didn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Because among smaller communities than that, the, the education was not as complete. And so there still was a huge stigma about the AIDS and that. And it would have been hard for the families too, if people found out because they probably would have been avoided mm-hmm. in that, um, partially out of fear and, and whatever religious issues and that popped up. Um, and just out of curiosity, did you do any kind of training or um, conflict remediation with local law enforcement? Really? That I don't know because of they that really didn't pop up. Um, we had, I mean, through the business guild, I mean, just strictly from the lesbian gay point mm-hmm. of view, um, I mean, Sheriff Barnes was there at several meetings and, and, yeah, he, he was and talked about good. issues and very, very mm-hmm. open and supportive asking questions. So with St. Guilford, we were doing pretty well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, let's switch to the Triad Business Guild. Um, when did you first uh, become members? That was in the 90s. Yeah, it was in the 90s. Um, we, it, yeah, I'd say it kind of grew out of the, the social group that met for the potlucks and uh-huh. the wild, crazy things. Well, and there, there were groups of friends that were going like to a Mexican restaurant on Friday night. Yeah, right. Anybody who wants to come can come and we get a real big table. They, the, bar, the owners of the restaurant know we're all gay, lesbian. So there were groups like that forming before the guild came into being mm-hmm. because we went to a Mexican restaurant that's right there close Not to anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's close to where the cycle de oro it's cat was kind of mm-hmm. cornered across the street. We went to that for four or five years. But then when the guild formed we heard about this group of professionals, the Triad Business and Professional Guild, that was meeting at the Marriott once a month for a dinner and a, a program. And so we went and joined the guild uh, and would go to the meetings every month. Uh, about a year or so after joining the guild, I was approached about serving on the board of directors for to help with education or different committees on the board of education of the guild. And as the years went by, I served one year as the president of the guild. So one of my one of the programs that I was proudest of was I got students from the Jewish Academy. Mm-hmm. They had an LGBT group that was formed uh, at the Academy. And I got them to come and talk about what life was like for them. I shared with the director, of the advisor for, for the group, my experience growing up Mm -hmm. that I was in the closet like I I never came out to my parents and I did come out to my three siblings um, and they all reacted in different ways some were positive some were negative Uh, I feel like my parents knew 
because once when I was visiting my parents for the weekend, Mom and I were watching her favorite soap opera, and she looked at me and she said, Johnny, can I ask you something? And my thought to myself was, oh, shit. And I said, Mother, you can ask me anything you want. And she said, is Bruce good to you? And I said, Mom, Bruce is great with me. If I'm happy, he wants to celebrate. If I'm upset, he wants to know what made me upset. If I'm sad, he gives me his shoulder to cry on. And I said, he's always there for me. And her response to me was, that's good, that's important, that's all I want to know. I probably should have prefaced that story by telling you that I was a PK, a preacher's kid, Southern Baptist minister. And I did not know how both of my parents would react because dad would have a hard time with acceptance and condoning. And I felt like I should not be confrontational with him. Once when we were at a McGee family reunion, the McGees were all from right around here, Winston, High Point, Thomasville, Greensboro. Um, the oldest member of the family had to introduce their family members that were at the reunion. Dad went through, Mom, my older sister was there, my younger sister was there, I was there. He introduced me, and he said, and this is Bruce, my other son, who lives with Johnny. That was acceptance. So they knew. I just didn't make an issue of, of coming out to them. Right. Well, that's a beautiful story. Hmm. Were you able to, uh, to keep the tears in when you heard your father say that at that moment? <laughs> uh, what, whoa? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, that when he introduced Bruce as my other son, I knew that he knew that I was gay and it was okay. Because I was very open with them mm -hmm. about the Triad Health Project, mm -hmm. forming that group and the work that I was doing through Triad Health Project. And they just put two and two together. Right. But, wow. That's just a wonderful story. Yeah. Um, was your, your family equally accepting? Did, were you able to come out? <laughs> well, I only had one sibling. Okay. Um, and we were both at the University of Iowa. About, well, we had overlap for several years. And my sister knew who I hung out with, so mm -hmm. she just, okay. Uh, no big deal for her. And um, my parents, we never, um, as long as you didn't talk about it, it was fine. And Johnny was, I mean, was always coming home, you know, holidays we were together as a family, vacations, we'd come down to, to the beach uh, every summer in June, and everybody was there together. Um, so there was never, as long as you didn't talk about it, it was absolutely fine. And when finally, when the Court of Appeals allowed us to get married in North Carolina, um, we did it right away because we knew with the current legislature we have, it might get taken back away again. Um, and that was in, we got married in November and we usually spent Christmas in Iowa, um, we fly out to, or fly or drive out to Iowa and then take my mother in my hometown over to my sister's, which was the other end of the other state. And I figured we better say something, um, uh, because my mother didn't know, but of course my sister knew and my nephews knew and my niece, their, their wives knew. And they wanted to celebrate because they hadn't been able to come out for the wedding because it was kind of a last minute put together uh, pretty quickly so we could get it done. Um, and so we were driving and there's a picture up on the wall of the, the, the hey mom, I finally got married. Um, <laughs> and it was pretty much like that. We were about halfway to my sister's, which was about a four hours drive. And we said, oh, by the way, did you notice the gold ring? And this is what happened. And he was basically like, well, I guess we should celebrate and that was <laughs> left at that but there was never any, any not acceptance I mean my, my cousins my older cousins my mother's cousins you know if I was there by myself it's like where's Johnny 
and that. So it was never a problem. I mean, it was just, as long as you didn't talk about it, it was just fine. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a bit about the experience in the process for moving towards marriage equality in North Carolina and filing, finally being able to get married? Well, I mean, we've been together for over 30 years. I mean, we were basically married. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, our idea of a wild time was, you know, going to a movie um, or going to a group that had bollocks, <laughs> um, that kind of stuff. So the, the gay lifestyle was pretty, pretty calm and bland, <laughs> if you will. Um, it was frustrating because... Uh, Actually, I was lucky in that my company went through a couple mergers and that, as a result of one of those mergers, a uh, Swiss company and a, and a British company merged, and then all of a sudden we've had a access to uh, being able to like do our benefits with a non-married partner at that time. So I could actually put um, Johnny under my health care insurance when I needed it, I could list him as a beneficiary on all the, the benefits at work and that. So we had sort of partial rights in that, um, but we really didn't have the legal protection. And we had a very good lawyer, so we had all the you know visitation rights in case one of us got ill. Um, we had estates set up so that they were protected pretty much. Um, but. Um, I mean, it was, it was it was just kind of frustrating knowing that you know here we are a very stable relationship together all these years we've got straight friends that are um, and within my family and both our families are getting divorced you know their marriages are nowhere near as stable um, yet they have all these other rights that we don't have um, and so from that and really the reason I think we, we dove so fast is when the court of appeals did. Mm -hmm. uh, negate the North Carolina law was that we wanted to have that in place uh, because you know we were both in our 60s mm -hmm. and that uh, and wanted to make sure that we had uh, the protections that we felt we needed mm -hmm. in case something would happen. Mm -hmm. um, so just a random question so you, mm -hmm. being involved as much as you were with the AIDS crisis and AIDS was Kind of the land, one of the landmark events for LGBT populations mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, were you aware of Stonewall when it happened, or can you speak to what Stonewall means to you? I think Stonewall was that spark that started a lot of the LGBT people coming together. The reaction to how the police force treated all of the gay and lesbian people, uh, I think really brought the fact that we need to come together, we need to join together, we need to be vocal, we need to be seen, we need to be out there. Because the only way people are going to learn that this is not a choice, it's not an option, this is something that's very in the core of the genetic. You know, and I think that sparked everything to begin to bring people together, to make a difference, mm -hmm. to establish this is the LGBT community mm -hmm. in the area. I can be out and open without being afraid. Because uh, I know it did help me to see that I could be gay and still get along fine in society. I can be a contributing part of the community of the community. Um, my younger sister, I came out to my three siblings with a letter. My younger si my Kathy, the youngest in the family, was very much on the right religious side. I got a letter back from Kathy quoting scripture that I was going to go to hell, that being gay was wrong, and I simply responded to Kathy face to face, I did not approve of you and Leon getting married. I did not think he was the right person for you. To my pleasant surprise, 
He's been a wonderful spouse, a wonderful partner, a wonderful father to their two girls. And about, oh, I guess it's been about four years ago, my phone rang. It was Kathy's younger, younger daughter. She wanted me to tell her how her parents responded when I told them that I was gay. And so I told her, I said, they were negative. They quoted scripture that I was going to go to hell. And I said, I would think over the years that we have shown them that we have a very loving, supportive relationship and that we do have a right to be married. My response to Rachel, to her question, Rachel, are you getting ready to come out to your parents? Because we've always suspected that she was gay. And she said, well, yeah, I've met somebody and I want that person to be a part of my life. And I said, Rachel, I hope you, I, I hope that we have educated your mother and father that they would not say the things that they said to me when you come out to them. But I said, you need to know that if they turn their backs on you, if they kick you out of the house, we are here for you. All you have to do is call. If you need money, if you need somebody to listen, if you need somebody to be supportive of you, you've got the two of us here. And apparently, they're fine with her being a lesbian. So I guess we did educate both of them as to what being gay and lesbian is all about. I think what's really kind of worked best for us is that, you know, we just treat it as natural. And, that, and I know for the work, and I was working for, it was originally a Swiss company, fairly conservative and that, but I never, I didn't, was like, oh, I'm gay, oh, I'm gay. It was more just like, yeah, it was, you know, Johnny was my partner and that sort of thing. And my staff would come out here for Christmas dinner and that because he would cook for them and and that just, you know, and they'd ask. It was like natural, like anybody else's spouse and that. And we never treated it as something that had to be hidden and something that had to be um, not talked about and that. I mean, we didn't make an issue out of it. it just and that, and that seemed to work the best because I've never can really feel that I've had an issue, uh, even at work, when I was working, um, where I had to, that was, an, you know, a problem, you know, he's was gay, and that thing, um, there was one or two people that, that you could tell were not as comfortable with it, but they, there was such a, it was so natural to everybody else, I mean, because you'd walk into it, you know, like, where's Johnny, how's Johnny, sort of thing, and, and since they were treating it as normal, it, it kind of came across, and the same thing with other groups or organizations we've been involved with, it's just been like, you know, we just never treated it as something special. It was just, it is as it is. Um, and I think that that gave people a comfort zone. Um, and so, it, you know, it's not a big deal. My last year at, at High Point, I was looking for something different to do. And there was an ad in the paper about translators needed in Winston-Salem. I called the number and come to find out it was AT&T. They were starting a translations group in Winston to translate all of the operations, maintenance, manuals, mm -hmm. so that they could sell their telephone switches around the world. And I got a position there as a translator. AT&T, as a company, already had LGBT groups at the different large sites. So I was out at work. You know, they, they knew that Bruce was my partner. Uh, and... A couple of years, I was asked during the month of June to have some, or either in October at National Coming Out Day, to put together a panel discussion about 
LGBT, about AIDS, about whatever. And I would try to get local people to come and share their story. Uh, I had a young guy, uh, he has a twin brother. He is gay, the brother's straight, the mother is very supportive. They came and spoke about his growing up gay in Winston. And always, every time we had a program, people would come and say, thank you so much for putting that together. This really opened my eyes as to what it's like to grow up gay. So even when I was at, at AT&T, I was trying to help in any way that I could to help educate. The last place that I taught, when I was laid off from Lucent, when AT&T was split up, uh, they kept us with the, the actual part of the company that was making the switches and selling them. Uh, but I got a position at Bennett College teaching Spanish. And I was very out from day one on Bennett about being gay. I wore my ear, earring to, to, <laughs> when I would go teach. I had a number of young lesbians who adopted me as their father. Four, two lesbian couples, black, and they would call me wherever we were, on campus, at the drugstore, in the grocery store, Dad, let's, let's buy this. And other people would look and frown, and I said, they adopted me. They're my daughters. So, you know, I tried to be a good example for the young lesbian students on campus that uh, I was accepting, that they could come and talk with me about anything. I didn't really put a plaque up on the door, but they knew if there was an issue, if there was a concern, they could come to me and I would help them. Um, and can, can, uh, before you go, know, you find the paternal. Yeah, yeah. Right over the corner. Uh, let's just try one first. Just for the record, for the people at home, we're having a major thunderstorm right now. <laughs> okay. That good? Yeah. I was worried we were going to fall apart. Yeah. <laughs> it's really quite beautiful in the storm watching the storm. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so, Bennett, what, when were you at Bennett? When were you teaching? Um, I, I left Bennett in 2015. Okay. And what would you say the climate was like on campus for men, for LGB, for lesbian Bennett students? Uh, I think it was very supportive. There were a number of faculty members who were gay or lesbian. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them were very out and open. Mm -hmm. uh, even bringing their partner, mm -hmm. like he would go with me to basketball games. Mm -hmm. Several of my girls were playing on the basketball team. And I felt it was important couple of them were my daughters. It was important to them for me to be there. So I tried to go to every home game and would cheer and root for, for the team. Uh, the team, even those that were not lesbian or gay, but who were in, Mr. McGee, thank you so much for coming to the game. There are very few faculty members that come. Most of the people that come are the coaches you know, or people like that. But I would even go to the games at GTCC to cheer for them because it was a, it was in town. It wasn't having to make a trip out of town. But uh, and other students who were not gay, Mr. McGee, thank you for coming to the games. It means a lot. Even the coach would come over. Thanks for being here. It means a lot. Do any of your Bennett daughters keep in touch with you? Oh, they're in my cell phone. <laughs> I, get, I get a phone call every Christmas from a couple of them. Mm -hmm. 
in fact, one year, one called the other friend, and then they called me, so I had, there were three of us in the conversation. Um, did you ever do any work with uh, the GTTCC, the Greensboro Technical Community College system? Never did anything with, with them. Okay. But, um, right. How about the NT? Not really a lot with uh, North Carolina A&T, other than some of the students that signed up, there's, there's a consortium of all the schools that are in Greensboro, where a student at Bennett can pay her tuition and can get on board the heat bus, higher education area transit, and go to North Carolina A&T, to UNCG, to Guilford College, to Greensboro College, and take courses. A lot of the girls that come to AT&T, to Bennett, their mothers were graduates of Bennett. And they would come to Bennett and take nursing courses at AT&T and graduate with a nursing degree from Bennett College. Um, as tuition, room and board was going up at Bennett, I started trying to talk to the girls that were freshmen, sophomores, and say, honey, if you would go and register at a North Carolina A&T, you can save a ton of money. You're paying Bennett tuition to take a course at A&T. Bennett's making money off of that tuition money because A&T's tuition is a lot cheaper. And you know, it's a tradition in my family. The, the females graduate from Bennett. And I said, that's fine. I'm not, I'm just putting the cards on the table that you can save a bunch of money. But no, I want to graduate from Bennett. That's fine, I want you to graduate from Bennett. <laughs> um, were you involved with any other organizations aside from um, the Triad Health Project and the Triad Professional Business, Business and Professional Group? Those are the, the two larger you know, groups. Because I've always looked at THP as my baby. How many lives do you think you both kind of saved or made, uh, you know, better in, for what they had, for the time they had in the course of working with the Triad Health Project? I wouldn't know where to begin with the number, but I mean, by the time you work with the clients, when the client would pass away, you were working with the, the family. One, we had a, a we had a buddy that was in Fuquay, Farina. His background was drugs, a young black family, still with his wife. He had a couple of sons. When he passed away, I went to the funeral out of respect for the, the wife and the, the children and a respect of him. And the wife said, come by the house. Would you go to the funeral home and pick up the death certificates? I'm going to need those. So when I got to the house, the older son who was in high school was very down, very despondent. He was sitting out on the swing on the front porch. I went out and sat next to him and I said, what's up with you? You're not the you that I have come to know and love. And he looked at me and he said, what do I tell my friends? Luckily, I have the death certificate with me. I gave him a, a copy of the death certificate and I said, look if you will under cause of death. He looked and I said, do you see the word AIDS? No, sir. Do you see HIV positive? 
no sir. AIDS did not kill your father. If your friends at school want to know, you can tell them any one of these issues when he died that was a contributing factor to your father's death. You don't have to say the word AIDS or HIV positive. His expression completely changed. He had a smile on his face. He reached over and hugged me and he said, thank you so much for empowering me to tell the truth, not the whole truth. And I said, you never have to tell anybody that your father died of AIDS. You can use any one of these causes of death. But I mean, that right there was worth, worth it all. To have been able to empower that young boy to go back to school and to share with his neighbors, this is what happened with my father. But not have to reveal the whole story. So, um, speaking of generational differences... Um, Ignore it. Okay. Um, speaking of general, general, generational differences and how the conception of AIDS and LGBT identity has changed over time, can you speak a bit about what it was like to be gay back in the day versus what it is now? I think society and when I say society, I'm talking young, old, middle age. I'm talking black, white, Hispanic, Asian. I think there's a lot more acceptance now than there was back in the 80s and the early 90s. I would, it's growing up as an Iowa farm boy <laughs> in a very small little town, which 80-60% were his relatives one way or another. I would say it's changed a lot in that when I was growing up there, it was a topic that you just didn't know anything about because it was a strange old man that lived up the street and put candy in his pockets for the kids to get him out. Um, that was your idea. Okay. Whereas these days, you know, I'm around the relatives who are in their 70s or 80s and it's like, they may not be supportive of it, but it's just a general topic. Oh, so and so, you know, well, you know, he's got his friend, and that, you know, it's gay. I mean, they'll mention it like it's not a big deal. Um, they may not support the idea, and that. I mean, we never had a problem because I was related to them, so therefore, as long as I didn't kill somebody on Main Street, you know, I was fine. Um, because and once with his family, once his father gave the seal of approval, when we got married, of course, he didn't say anything to anybody. Um, we were talking to a pretty conservative crowd, and that, but one of the cousins who has to know everything found out, and of course, he told everybody. And we walked into a family reunion, and we've got 70 and 80 year old redneck. Um, Family members giving us a hug and <laughs> going, What's this person doing? <laughs> going, Congratulations, why didn't you tell us? We're so happy. Da, 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 da. It's about so I time. think it's it's not so much that I think acceptance in that it's become a norm. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm watching you know, my mother's, my father's friends who are in their 80s um, and they just mention it like it's like, oh yeah, so and so, blah, blah, blah. Um, whereas in the past they wouldn't even really even said the word. And you know? but now it's just like, yeah, it happens. And that, you know, my father, I never maybe never really formally came out to my parents, but when we were at my father's house after we got married and he didn't say anything, but he called my stepsister after we left and go, What does it mean when two men have gold wedding bands on? And I this is a blessed her heart just said, look, you idiot, it means that they're married, you know, they love each other, and da -da. And he just kind of went, oh, it must be a bogey thing, which is my mother's side of the family, <laughs> and that uh, went on. And, it's, and it's, when he calls, he talks to him first, and they, they chatter forever, and that. So it, it's, I think it's not, again, I don't, wouldn't really call it true acceptance, it's not like, yay. Um, but it's more of just that oh, it's boy, become yeah. a norm. 
you know, it's not something that, that's hushed up. It's not something that, that you don't talk about. You know, it's just, yeah. When I was growing up, there weren't gay characters on television. There weren't gay comedians performing in the comedy clubs. There weren't gay politicians. Or if there were gay politicians, they were very plausible. I think over the years, as society has become more aware, that it's been easier and easier to come out. You know, the young high school students that are coming out to their parents, even the young four-year-old children that are looking at their parents, I don't want to wear those clothes. I want to wear dresses. And you know, where they perceive themselves as female and the parents are not being judgmental. They're being more accepting. What can I do to help my child as the child is growing up? You know, you can't go up as a four-year-old and get a sex change operation. You know, you have to be a responsible adult who's got money <laughs> to pay for. <laughs> but, uh, and we didn't have shows like Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey who were trying to help educate the public about different issues. Um, and I think it's a lot easier today for someone to, to come out than it was back in the 60s, 70s, or the 80s. So I'm very encouraged that we're doing a better job of accepting people for who they are. You know, I big applause to those parents of that four-year-old child that perceives themselves as female or as male. And the parents are being supportive and going, instead of let me find somebody to drive this out of my child, to do a bit aversion therapy with my child, they're going, let's go to a pediatrician that's aware. And work with that pediatrician to make this life, as it's advancing, acceptable and easy. Did you ever have to work with anyone who had been through that therapy, the gay aversion therapy? The aversion therapy. Yes. Nobody that I know ever went through anything like that. I can imagine it's very hard. You know, very, well, probably, a lot of shock treatments, stuff like that. Is requested by a so-called psychiatrist. <laughs> I think it was more legally illegal in many states now. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's more family guilt process, <laughs> informal <laughs> inversion, right. inversion right. process. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, you've been here only since the '80s, but did you happen to hear about anyone mentioning the? Greensboro Gay Purge from the late 1950s. No, uh, okay, just thought I'd, I'd ask in the yeah, event. You not that familiar with that. Okay. Um, Go ahead. I was going to say, I'm related to that. Could you maybe speak to a little bit about how things have evolved over the past 30 years as far as social scene here in Greensboro? Um. I know you mentioned you know, early on finding Busby's yeah. downtown. Uh, you got any of the other? I don't, you know, I, it's been decades since we've been to some of the disco type clubs. I don't even know whether they're still there or not. Well, I'm sure they are, but I, yeah, I don't, we kind of, as we've gotten older, we've kind of, the group we normally work with are more professional and, and, and our age group within that. Um, and really, if we get together it's, as a group, it's um, pretty pretty bland. <laughs> it's that potluck group again. Through, um, through my association with the Guild, Terry Cartner, who was a president 
before I became president, Terry was asked to serve on the Board of Governors of the Human Rights Campaign. She served one term of two years, and then she tapped me on the shoulder. So for two terms, four years, I was one of nine people serving on the Board of Governors of the Human Rights Campaign representing the state of North Carolina. Can you speak a bit about that experience? I think serving on the Board of Governors helped me to open my eyes to a number of other issues, the transgender issues, that LGBTQ, that questioning side. I'm questioning my orientation. I'm, I have questions. Just made me more aware of other parts of the LGBTQ. Uh, there were two transgender friends that we met at the guild. <coughs> that um, one was very out and open because she had the money, I guess, from a parent that passed away, to be able to do the total change. Another was a transgender person from like Reedsville who did not have the money and was struggling to hold down a job because there weren't a lot of employers in Reedsville that were willing to have somebody in their company with hairy arms and Adam's apple presenting as a female. So it was, I think I benefited by ha having them as friends because they both helped educate me about a lot of the issues in the transgender community. Um, and what was the time period you served on board? That would have been towards the end of the days of the guild. Because uh, I know there was a guild in Charlotte and what they had done when their guild petered out, because that's basically what happened with us. I think the years of the guild, the benefits, had already been found about being a part of the guild, and people were looking at something else, looking for something different. What they did in Charlotte, they formed the LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce. They've got a separate chamber of commerce that's LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. Greensboro, that I know, never considered that as an option as the guild was, was petering out. And uh, I think the guild had served its purpose. It had opened a lot of doors for people, both in professional-wise, individual-wise, as a community. Um, and so it was time to move, for things to just move on. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything we haven't covered that you would like to talk about? Can't think of anything. Not really. You know, I, I just think the combination of AIDS hitting the triad when it did, People, gay, lesbian people coming together, concerned straight people to make a difference in the lives of the people that were being infected and affected by HIV AIDS. The birth of the guild and people, professional people willing to come out and say, yep, I'm gay, I'm fine with it, hope you are. You know, that. I think that all of that has helped to educate our area resources, our people, uh, to be take that step and be a little better of a person. That's great. Well, thank you for speaking with us today. Oh, you're welcome. Letting us spend time with your kids. <laughs>